Okay, um, chapter 22 is taken up with Paul's testimony. So at the end of chapter 21, Paul is rescued from the mob by the Roman commander. He's led away. While he's being led away, he speaks to the Roman commander in a very impressive Greek. The commander realizes that he didn't really understand who the prisoner was. Paul asks for permission to speak to the crowd. That permission is granted. They stop on the stairs. Paul turns and he begins to speak in the Hebrew dialect. So he got the attention of the commander by speaking Greek. He gets the attention of the mob in Jerusalem by speaking Hebrew. And what he does is he begins to share his testimony. He says um, in verse 6 that on his way to Damascus, a, a bright light suddenly flashed from heaven. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice, a voice that called him by name and asked him a question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So his testimony has to do with something he saw, something he heard, and then later something he couldn't see because he was blinded. Now we. We're asking the question as we see the testimony recounting Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus in chapter 22 and again in chapter 26, why do we have the story told in three chapters? The place where it happens, chapter 7, the place where he gives his testimony to the crowd, chapter 22, and the place where he gives his testimony at one of the trials to one of his judges, chapter chapter 26. Well, I would say first, because a testimony is very important. One of the greatest weapons you have as a Christian is your testimony, the story of your conversion. And you know, the world may dispute something that happened in the Bible. The world may say, I don't believe in, in creation. Or the world may say, I don't believe in the parting of the Red Sea. Or the world may say, I don't believe Jesus raised Lazarus. And the world can say that. But what can the world say about the change in your life? And see, that's the other thing. That's the other reason it's so important that it's repeated three times. The conversion of one of the greatest enemies of Christianity to one of the greatest friends of Christianity is itself a powerful argument for the truth of our faith. Someone may say, well, he was lying. Really? Why would he lie? He was on the side that was winning. He was on the side that was strong. He was on the side of the majority. What did he get by lying? Suffering, imprisonment, beating, and a martyr's death. He had fame, he had position, he had advantages as long as he stayed on the side of the persecutors. What would it benefit him to lie? Plus, these people, these witnesses to Christianity, if they were lying, they have brought to the world the highest ethical standard of truth in history. No ethic has ever been given to the world that comes near Christianity which places a higher value on honesty and telling the truth. Why would these people on the one hand in, insist that we always tell the truth even if we suffer for the truth and all the while they were lying about their own experience? Paul tells the story of his conversion. He relates a miracle the blinding light, verse 6, the voice from the sky, verse 8, the instructions to go to Damascus, verse 10, the meeting with and the um, initial discipleship with Ananias, verse 12, his baptism, I have to say something about verse 16. Acts 22, 16 is used by people who believe 
that baptism saves us. This is the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. That is, that the contact with the water itself in the act of baptism is the thing which causes us to be born again. Now, the first thing I'll say is that if that is true, then we are not saved by grace, we're saved by works. Because baptism is a work. And I'm not going to stop and take the time here to try to refute the arguments for baptismal regeneration. I will just say this. That argument rests on a misunderstanding of three verses in Scripture. One verse is in 1 Peter 3, and the other two verses are in Acts. Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16. And since we're in Acts 22, I only mention it here. The quote is, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. And so the argument goes, When we are baptized, we wash away our sins. I'm not a Greek scholar and I'm not going to pretend to be, but those who are Greek scholars tell us that grammatically it's clear in the verse, in the original language, that the washing away of our sins is connected to calling on the name of the Lord, not to being baptized. So, I just mention it this time to tell you that this is a verse used to argue that we are saved by baptism, but it's not a good argument. And it, it, it may be confusing in Russian, it is confusing in English, but it's not confusing in Greek. It's clear in Greek that you can't make that argument. Paul then tells about his return to the Jerusalem and how he prayed uh, in the temple and about how um, he had been involved in the martyrdom of Stephen, verse 20. Now look at what happens. They listen to all these things. They listen to his claim of a miracle. They listen to his claim of hearing Jesus' voice from heaven. They listen to his confession that he had been baptized and they don't get upset. But when he mentions the Gentiles, when he mentions that God wanted him to go and minister to the Gentiles to help the Gentiles, then they tried to kill him. And a while ago, I mentioned Jesus' sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. They were praising Jesus at the beginning of that sermon. But when Jesus showed them at the end of the sermon that God rescued a Gentile woman from starving to death, the widow of Zarephath, through Elijah, and that God healed a Gentile leper, Naaman the Syrian, through Elisha, when Jesus pointed that out, which has been part of the Old Testament for thousands of years, but when Jesus just pointed that out, that God showed mercy to Gentiles, that's when they tried to kill Him. And so when Paul says, you know, God's going to show mercy to Gentiles, God's going to bring salvation to Gentiles, they try to kill Him. Now let me tell you something. If you don't think racial prejudice is a powerful force, and if you don't think the arrogance of a proud nationalism is a powerful force, you're very much mistaken. These prejudices and these kinds of pride have a powerful grip on people. The kind of grip that makes them willing to die and willing to kill. Now we've got to ask this question. Paul is bringing this powerful testimony, he's bringing these great arguments. Paul brings the testimony of the change in his own life. Jesus in Luke 4 brought the testimony of the Scripture from the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And yet the people try to kill Jesus, and they try to kill Paul. 
Why? An argument and proof of the truth is not enough to convert anybody. We have to understand that the mind of man is fallen. And he can't appropriate the truth. He can't see the significance of the truth. And the heart of man is corrupt. And he cannot love the truth. He hates the truth. And the will of man is perverted. He cannot obey the truth or conform his life to the implications of, of the truth. It takes something else more than showing people the truth. God has to do something. God has to reach down and change their nature. When Saul of Tarsus met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, by God's grace, by a powerful act of mercy, he was converted. His nature was changed. His eyes were open to see the truth. His heart was open to love the truth and to respond to the Lord and to obey Him. So we do our part as evangelists, but one of the main works of evangelism is praying, not just preaching and telling the truth, but praying that God will change people and open their hearts. This is kind of a crude example. Forgive me, but it's an example that communicates. Why does a bee fly to a flower, the most fragrant, perfumed thing in nature? And why does a fly fly to the most repulsive thing in nature, a thing that's awful? The fly loves that awful thing as much as the bee loves the flower. Why? Because they have a different nature. The nature of the bee loves the perfumed flower. And it just so happens that in that way, our nature is like the nature of the bee because we love the flower too. We love to look at the flower. We love to hold the flower. We love the smell of the flower. But that thing which the fly goes to, we want to get as far away from that as possible because our nature is not like the fly. But to the, to the fly, that thing is perfume. That thing is a flower to the fly because he has a different nature. You see, until God changes our fallen nature, the beauty of the gospel will be ugly to us. The perfume of the gospel will smell bad to us. Paul was changed. It was his, it became his, Paul used to hate the Gentiles too. Paul hated the Gentiles just like these people hated the Gentiles. But what happened? His nature was changed. And he grew to love the Gentiles. He gave his life for the Gentiles, and he gave up his life for the Gentiles. But the crowd, who have a different nature, they hear this reference to the Gentiles, and here's what they say, verse 22. Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. They want to kill him. And they, they behave like animals. It says they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air. So what happens is that the commander concludes, you know, he must have said something terrible. He must really be something awful. So I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So they decide to torture him. He's going to bring him back to the prison and he's going to beat him and torture him until he gets the true story out of him. That's what it says in verse 24. And in verse 25, they're stretching him out. 
getting ready to torture him, getting ready to beat him. And Paul says, Are you sure it's not against the law for you to do this to me since I'm a Roman? So the first thing he does in chapter 21 is he shows the man that he can speak wonderful Greek. And he makes the man understand that he's not who he thought he was. Now, he informs the man that he's a Roman citizen, which also the man did not know. You see, you couldn't torture a Roman citizen without a trial. For instance, you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. You know that Andrew was crucified? Do you know that Peter was crucified? But when Paul was killed, he had his head cut off because it was illegal to crucify a Roman citizen. The commander says to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And Paul said, yes. And the commander, he says something a little bit personal. He said, you know, I'm a Roman citizen too, and I paid a lot of money for it. Paul said, yes, but I was born a Roman citizen. It's amazing how Paul, Paul uses these little facts of his biography to his advantage. I'm from Tarsus, which is not a little or an un, unimportant place. I was born a Roman citizen. He's claiming his rights under Roman law. So they let him go because they were afraid they'd done something illegal. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. They had put him in chains without trying him, and he was a Roman citizen. But the next day, now this is the last verse of Acts 22. The next day, he is ordered to appear before the Sanhedrin. You know, the Sanhedrin, also called the council, were these 70 people who ruled religious Jerusalem. Gamaliel was on the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus was on the Sanhedrin. Mostly Sadducees, but a few Pharisees. They brought Paul down and set him before the Sanhedrin. John Stott counts five trials by Paul of Paul at the end of the book of Acts. Five trials. Um, and this is one of those trials. Some scholars count five trials for Jesus. Some say two by the Sanhedrin, two by Pilate, and one by Herod. Um, some people count um, six or seven trials for the Lord Jesus. John Stott counts five trials for Paul. It depends on the way you, you divide it up. Um, Paul looks at the Sanhedrin, he calls them brothers, and he says that he has been living according to the tradition of the fathers with a clear conscience. Annas the high priest orders that he be hit in the mouth. And when Paul is hit in the mouth, he says to the person who commanded that he be hit in the mouth, Anna the, Annas the high priest, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You're breaking the law by ordering me to be struck. Someone said, are you going to talk to God's high priest this way? Now amazingly, Paul apologized because he said he didn't realize it was the high priest. Either Paul had never seen Annas, which seems very, very unlikely, or Annas had changed so much over the years that he didn't recognize him, or Paul couldn't see very well. You know, there is a tradition that Paul was almost blind. You know, one of the epistles, he says, see, I write this with my own hand. And we think that the epistles were written by a secretary, what scholars call an amanuensis, 
someone who was writing for Paul while he dictated. And there's this theory that Paul couldn't see. And this could be consistent with that theory, that he didn't know that it was the high priest because he couldn't see him well enough to know that it was the high priest. But the thing that's significant here is how meek Paul is. He's just been hit in the mouth, but he's meek. He's gracious. He apologizes for saying anything about it. He says in verse 5, I was not aware that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. He quotes, Acts, uh, he quotes Exodus 22. But now Paul, Paul is a little bit clever again. In chapter 21, he uses the fact that he knows Greek to get the attention of the commander. In Acts 22, he uses the fact that he is a Roman citizen to avoid being beaten and tortured and illegally detained. In Acts chapter 23, he uses the fact that he is a Pharisee. First, he used his legal Roman affiliation plus his language acquisition and his culture. Now he uses his religious affiliation because he knows that there are a few Pharisees on the Sanhedrin. And so he just cries out, brethren, I'm a, this is chapter 23, verse 6, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Now, why did he say that? Well, he said that because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they dominated the Sanhedrin. And he knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees always used to fight about this. So this is a little bit clever of Paul. It's actually a little bit funny. When Paul says this, it starts a fight. It starts a fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees over the doctrine of the resurrection. So finally, the Pharisees who were in the Sanhedrin stood up and said, we don't find anything wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel did speak to him? So the commander steps in again because he was afraid that Paul would be torn into pieces in this fight. And he ordered the troops to take him away and bring him back to the barracks by force. Now, from there they decide to take him to be tried in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi had much better weather and it was a much nicer place. It was on the sea coast than Jerusalem. So the Roman officials used to hang out down there and spend time down there because it was a lot more pleasant down there. That was like their, their dacha, their vacation house on the, on the coast. And so it was 65 miles away. So to bring him into the presence of the Roman officials who would judge him and make up their mind about what they were going to do with him, they decided that the next day they were going to take him down to Caesarea Philippi. Okay, the Jews knew of this plan. This is one of the most amazing things in the book. This shows how much they hated him. And this shows the lengths they were willing to go to to get rid of him. And I can only believe that the reason they wanted so desperately to get rid of him, rid of him is that he could prove that they were wrong. They couldn't win a debate with him. They couldn't win the crowd over if he made his points and they made their points. His points were stronger than their points. So instead of coming over to the side of the truth, their solution was to kill him. Now, here's how serious they were. Acts 23, 14. We, we have bound ourselves together under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. In other words, they're fasting. They're going to fast until he's dead. They promise God and each other and the priests that they're not going to eat until they kill him. 
Well, we know that he lived at least two more years. We wonder if they died of starvation. I wonder how they felt when they broke that oath. I wonder how they felt when they took food. I wonder how long they each lasted. I wonder how they justified breaking the oath. I wonder if they ever faced the priests again. I wonder if they ever talked about it with each other. I wonder if they ever thought maybe God really is on Paul's side. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe we were wrong to want to kill him. Maybe we're wrong in the way we interpret Jewish history, recent Jewish history and ancient Jewish prophecy. Maybe Jesus the Nazarene really is the Messiah. I wonder if they had any of those thoughts or if they just cursed their rotten luck and were embarrassed that they had made a promise that they couldn't keep. They swear an oath, but somehow Paul's nephew finds out about the plot. Verse 16, the son of Paul's sister. Boy, don't you wish we had a biography of Paul's sister? Don't you wish we had a biography of Paul's nephew? He's the hero. He finds out that there's this plot that when they take him out of the barracks to go down to Caesarea Philippi, they're going to overwhelm the guard and they're going to kill him. So uh, he tells Paul, Paul says, you've got to get this message to the Roman commander. So he does. Uh, there are more than 40 men who swore this oath that they're going to ambush Paul and kill him when the Romans try to ambush him, when the Romans try to take him to another jail, another prison, another court for another trial. By the way, I told you earlier that one of the most famous days in American history was November 22nd, 1963. That was a Friday. That was the day that the President of the United States was shot twice in Dallas, and he died a little while later in the hospital. It was, it was a day that changed our history forever. It changed everything. Horrible, terrible thing. Two days later, they were taking the man who shot him Lee Har Harvey Oswald from one jail to another. While they were taking him from one jail to another, a man called Jack Ruby walked up and shot Lee Harvey Oswald and he died during surgery a few hours later. While they were transporting him from one place to another, somebody killed him. Now Oswald was guilty but it was still a terrible thing for somebody to do. Jack Ruby later said that he was trying to save John Kennedy's widow from the ordeal of having this man tried over a period of months or years. We don't really know for sure what Jack Ruby's motives were. He died in prison, but he killed the killer of John Kennedy. Well, what Jack Ruby did with a guilty man these 40 Jews wanted to do with an innocent man. They also planned to attack Paul while he was being taken from one prison to another. Now, as American officials look back on it, they realized how stupid they were to publicize the time and the place when Oswald would be taken from one place to another. Everybody knew about it. Jack Ruby knew about it. So he took his gun and went down and waited and killed him as soon as he came out. So the Roman commander decides, well, we're going to leave at a time that they're not going to know about. Well, in the ancient world, you couldn't stand far from somebody and kill them. You had to get within arm's length of somebody or you couldn't kill them. If you couldn't touch them, you couldn't kill them. Well, you could throw a spear or use a bow and arrow, I guess. But that wasn't very likely. 
So first he set a great guard. And then he left in the middle of the night. Get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night. Three o'clock in the morning, they left. 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 men with spears. There's no way that 40 men could overwhelm that guard. Plus, they didn't know they were leaving in the middle of the night. So they took them down to Caesarea. And here we have another trial. Here, here we have the trial with the governor named Felix. The commander, whose name was Claudius Lysias, it's amazing that Luke gives us the name, he writes a letter to Felix. And you notice, as with the letters of Paul, in, in America, when we write a letter, we put our name at the end, which means if you open an envelope and you don't know who the letter's from, you've got to look at the end. Well, the ancients, I think they, they were a little bit smarter. They put the name of the writer at the beginning so you don't have to look to the end. When Paul writes an epistle, he puts his name first so you know who the letter's from. This Roman commander puts his name first, so it's Claudius Lysias writing to Felix, the Roman governor at Caesarea, verse 26. So he explains the situation to him. And he says, I'm turning the prisoner over to you. You can try him. You can do anything you want to with him. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.